SpaceX's Starbase is offering its strongest signals yet that it is nearing the first full-scale launch of its Starship vehicle, now expected for later this month. CEO Elon Musk even announced again that Starship is ready for launch, awaiting regulatory approval. As we know, Ship 24 was lifted and stacked atop Booster 7. After that, all of the scaffolding has officially been removed from the top of the orbital launch mount. Stage 0 has now shown readiness multiple times. According to Musk, he has declared that it looks like they don't need to do any more testing. Meanwhile, activities at the tank farm have been gradually getting busier. Interestingly enough, we recently saw something wonderful about a liquid oxygen tanker decorated in shuttle supply the Starbase tank farm for Starship. Besides that, we also saw a lot of liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen trucks lined up at the roadside delivery stations every day so far, which makes it clear that Starship needs fuel to feed all 39 wild engines. Having a substantial amount of liquid methane stored at the orbital tank farm will finally allow SpaceX to attempt the first major wet dress rehearsals and, more importantly, the first full static fires with flight-worthy Super Heavy booster prototypes. Of course, a tank farm with full supplies of liquid oxygen, liquid methane, and liquid nitrogen, as well as their gaseous equivalents, is also a necessity for the first orbital Starship launch attempt. But hold on a second, I see a lot of you are wondering where SpaceX gets its fuel from. The nearest liquid nitrogen facility for SpaceX is in Brownsville, Texas, just 30 kilometers away from their launch site. From there, SpaceX uses the transportation company Gen Ox to transport most of its liquid methane. They use state-of-the-art trailers specifically designed to hold liquid methane. For the trips to Boca Chica, each trailer can transport up to 13,000 gallons of liquid methane at a pressure of 70 PSI. Although this is a relatively high pressure, the methane is actually less dense at this stage than it will be when it's in the Starship rocket, since its operating pressure is closer to 100 PSI. Once the liquid methane arrives at the SpaceX site, it's slowly pumped into the massive tank farm where SpaceX stores its propellants. It takes several trailers just to transport enough methane for one Starship, so methane deliveries are a common sight between each test. Back to Starship's flight, don't go rushing down to South Texas just yet. We need the utmost certainty so as to not miss anything or, you know, waste our time. And honestly, after a rapid fire test campaign in 2020 and 2021 of launching Starship prototypes, the company has moved more cautiously at its development and test facility in South Texas. This is because the company has likely invested more than a billion dollars in a massive launch and catch tower to support Starship and Super Heavy as well as ground systems to support fueling of the massive vehicles. Because so many assets are clustered in a small area near the the Gulf of Mexico, SpaceX really does not want to take the risk of destroying infrastructure it has spent more than a year building and testing. This would set the Starship launch campaign back months at least while the area is rebuilt. It would also probably redouble regulatory concerns that were raised as part of the Federal Aviation Administration's process to clear the South Texas location for experimental orbital launches. Next off, astronauts recently had to fly the replacement Soyuz capsule to a new docking port at the space station. Astronaut Frank Rubio and cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Petalin undocked from their Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft from port on the station's Russian-built Poisk module at 4.45 a.m. EDT and parked it at a nearby berth at another Russian module, Prikol, at 5.22 a.m. EDT or 9.22 GMT. Cameras on the International Space Station captured the Soyuz parking spot swap in stunning detail. The video begins by showing the Soyuz spacecraft as it slowly backs away from the Russian side of the space station. As the Soyuz slowly pulled away from the space-facing Poisk docking module, Prokopiev manually fired its thrusters to steer it clear of the station. Prokopiev then guided the Soyuz MS-23 away from the station as both craft sailed 260 miles above the east coast of Africa and flew the capsule around the station to reach the Earth-facing Prakal module below the station. From start to finish, the flight took just 37 minutes, with the Soyuz docking successfully at the Prakal module with the spacecraft framed against the planet Earth in a breathtaking shot. 
The purpose of the relocation maneuver is twofold. Firstly, it will ensure that the Poisk docking module is clear for cosmonauts Prokopiev and Petalin to take spacewalks outside the station in April and May. Secondly, moving Soyuz makes way for the arrival of the uncrewed Roscosmos Progress 84 cargo spacecraft later this year. The next time the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft will undock from the station will be September 27th, when it carries Rubio, Prokopiev, and Petalin on a longer journey, returning the station crew members back to Earth. The three men were originally scheduled to land in March, but their original Soyuz spacecraft sprung a coolant leak in December, leaving it unable to safely return its crew home. Meanwhile, back on Earth, NASA is setting up the Moon to Mars office. NASA announced on March 30th it had created the Moon to Mars program office within the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate. The office will focus on integrating the various programs underway as part of the Artemis Lunar Exploration Campaign, from Orion and the Space launch system to the gateway, lunar landers, and spacesuits. Congress directed NASA to establish the office in a NASA authorization enacted last year as part of the CHIPS and Science Act. It stemmed from concerns within Congress and among NASA advisors that there was no single person overseeing all the programs that made up Artemis. The office is led by Amit Kshatriya, sorry if I didn't pronounce that correct, previously acting Deputy Associate Administrator for Common Exploration Systems Development. It's important to know what is is and it's important to know what isn't, he said of the new position in an interview at the Johnson Space Center after the Artemis II crew announcement on April 3rd. The managers of the various programs, he explained, are still doing the same jobs. This is primarily a realignment of the roles and responsibilities at headquarters, he said. That work was already underway before the passage of the Authorization Act to ensure consistent integration among the programs. What we're hoping to achieve is to accelerate a little bit of that headquarters reorganization organization and eliminate some duplication of effort in certain areas. I think what it really allows us to do is have that single focal point that's worried about our near-term missions, Jim Free, NASA Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development said of the office in an interview. I've really tried to focus that office to say that your job is to work on Artemis 2 through 5. That role, he noted, had been his responsibility before creating the office. I think it gives us that single point that everybody can go to, he said. He can track and worry about those missions every day. Kshatriya said his focus, first and foremost, is on Artemis 2. There are lessons learned from Artemis 1 we have to make sure we incorporate, he said, as well as completion of the SLS and Orion vehicles and work on ground systems needed for the mission. The next mission up is 100% my priority, to make sure that none of this realignment that we're doing impacts that. Part of the office's work, though, is to look ahead. One of the things we were charged with in the Moon to Mars office was to make sure that the tech developments and the mission modes we're picking were commensurate with potential future Mars-grade activities, he said. That ranges from testing closed-loop life support systems to development of the gateway. And that's just about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time.